chapter 6, verse 14. This comes right after the events of last, uh, last week when we sent out the 12. Uh, and this is kind of a weird, not so weird, but you get kind of a flashback happening uh, right here. So Mark chapter 6, we're going to pick up in verse 14. This is what the scripture says. Now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John for whom I beheaded. He has, he has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportunity, uh, sorry, then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Her Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him. And the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, uh, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. Then the disciple, when the disciples heard of this, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Let us pray. Father God, we come again before you. As we study this scripture, Father, as we understand what happened to um, yet another uh, follower uh, of you that, that, that prepared the way, uh, that pointed to the light, Father, we just ask that, um, Lord, that you, you make our hearts um, understanding of, of, of the potential of the call of, of you. Father, we may live our lives in accordance with your word, and not our ways. Christ, in my prayer. Amen. So, <clears throat> a little bit of a, I don't know what you call it, uh, macabre, is that the word? For, like, uh, uh, when you talk about death or whatever, but um, this, this morning as we take a look here, we're seeing uh, kind of a flashback. What you see in verse 14 is that King Herod starts to hear about Jesus. He is so popular, and we, and we know this. We see this from uh, the crowds that are gathering. You can't make this much noise without someone knowing who you are. And, and, and as more and more people knew who he was, King Herod figures it out. Now, I, I do need to just take a quick second. This is not the same King Herod uh, as... Uh, King Herod, who uh, ordered the, the murder of the innocent that we read about there uh, in Luke, and, and, and it created a situation where after uh, Jesus was born, that Mary and Joseph and them had to flee to Egypt. This is, uh, that guy uh, dies, in fact, when they get a message that they die, that's when they come back out of Egypt. Uh, and this is his, um, one of his, his sons, and, and the, the, it, it, to really understand this, you would have to do a lot of history on uh, King Herod and, and just the, the I mean, uh, whatever you think convoluted, uh, you know, pop star culture uh, families are, the, they got nothing on, on these people. Uh, these guys are nuts. Uh, Herod, uh, King Herod, who, who would kill all the, the babies, uh, he, he put to death some of his own kids. Like I mean, it just... Just, he was so concerned about who would take his kingdom over that he was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And so when his son, eventually the one who makes it, uh, gets up and, and we, we meet this King Herod, um, him not paying attention, not understanding that, that Jesus was once uh, called, uh, or sorry, that was once prophesied that he would, would take, would be king, 
him not like, recognizing that shouldn't really surprise you because in, in the way he grew up and the stories he heard of his dad, everybody was about to take the kingdom. So that, that, that kind of makes sense there. But uh, he had a weird upbringing. Uh, what we understand is that he had what we think at least eight different wives. And the one that really did uh, kind of did him in, so to speak, is this lady, um, uh, Herodias, and uh, because she was originally his brother, actually it was like his half brother, uh, Philip's wife, and uh, you know what Herod wanted, Herod got and decided that she was pretty attractive and and, and took her from his uh, his his brother, uh, and so just just a weird story, really, just just a weird dysfunctional family uh, right there. And John the Baptist uh, was going around at, at the time, or at least before this had happened, John the Baptist had been going around and was preaching, prepare the way, prepare the way. He was convicting of sins and, and people liked him. Uh, the reason that people would have really liked him is that all the pomp and circumstances around John the Baptist birth. Remember, he was, uh, his father was a, a priest in the temple, or sorry, in the, in the most holy, this once a year opportunity, once a lifetime opportunity that he's in there and they know he has a vision because he comes out uh, and he can't talk. And, and he can't talk until, uh, and they're way too old, uh, they have a baby in this way, way advanced stage and, and not until they name the baby, he's able to speak and he says, and he shall be named uh, John, uh, and then they go, oh, because that's it. So they know who he is. And, and John wanders in the spirit of Elijah. He is taken, uh, he, he, he's, uh, he's not eating anything uh, dead. He's wandering around in the woods, with, uh, in, the, in the desert with locusts, uh, eating locusts, and in, in like burlap, I guess. And uh, he is a known figure. And people go and, and listen to him speak. And because of his uh, speech, even Herod was like, I kind of like this guy. I like what he says. Right up until John did the one thing that, that he shouldn't have done. No, I shouldn't say shouldn't have did. That, that if one was worried about popularity, if one was worried about uh, not losing your head, shouldn't have done. And that's when he said, hey, marriage is a sacred thing. For, for you, uh, Herod, you should not be married to your brother's wife. That is against all sorts of law. You should not, you know, all the wives, this is, this is not what you want. And King Herod goes, no, I don't like that too much. I don't think I like that. Well, it really made his wife mad. And so what does Herod do? He says, well, I, I know I can't kill him, so I'm going to throw him in prison. And so Herod throws John the Baptist in prison, and he stays there for quite a while. I don't actually know how long John the Baptist was in prison. But he's in prison, and what we understand is that Herod was like, oh, he's kind of a neat threat. I kind of like him. I like what he has to say. I wish he wouldn't talk about my marriage, but other than that, I kind of like him. Well, Herodias um, wasn't, was not about to, uh, to deal with that, and she wanted him dead. And so she, she is waiting, she's vengeful, she is waiting until this, this opportune time, and uh, this opportune time would eventually come when, uh, when King Herod has this huge feast, and that's what we just read about. He has this huge feast, and her daughter gets up and dances, and I have uh, no idea, nor do I care to have an imagination, on what the dance looked like, Okay? Let's not go there. All right? But it was enough that everybody was very entertained and felt very, very good about this dance. And so much so that King Herod says, you're wonderful. You have whatever you want up to half my kingdom. Now, for the record, uh, the, the half your kingdom, he most likely was a give half the kingdom. It's kind of like a... Uh, an order, like a, just a phrase that you would say, but it, it did mean that whatever you ask for, I'm going to honor it. He could not not honor it because of all the people that were there. And so the daughter does, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to ask for, so she runs off to her mom and says, what do I ask for? And she goes, this is it. I want John the Baptist's head. And so King Herod, so she goes to King Herod and goes, I want John the Baptist's head. And she even adds a little extra flair to it on a platter. Can you imagine the dinner party, the phenomenal food that would have been consumed, the, 
the, uh, the, the, the guests, the visit, the, the, all these dictators, the who's who of this area would have been there, and in the middle of it, or at least towards the end of it, after the entertainment, this head, severed head on a platter comes walking through. There's John the Baptist. We, we see this, and I jumped kind of through the story there to get there, and we see this as a clear uh, foreshadowing of Jesus, because in verse 29 there, you see that his disciples came and they took care of the body, the, this mutilated body, and they tried to give some dignity to that. We see that, that very, very clear foreshadowing with what's going to eventually happen with Jesus. But as we jump back into this, this, all that story was kind of the background. All that story was really the background of what's going on because what's going, that, that story is, though important, what we're seeing here in verse 14 is that King Herod hears about who Jesus is and he is convinced it's John the Baptist. He came back from the dead. And in, in especially in times of antiquity, this was... If you were thought to kill a powerful person that, like, they could get reincarnated or resurrected or whatever, and they would come back, and Herod is convinced this is what happened, which is interesting because that does happen, by the way, when you kill the perfect one, right? This, this concern of the resurrection, uh, though, is not going to be true of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is, is gone. He is going to be in Abraham's bosom. He is, he is in glory, but... When Jesus dies, he does resurrect. He shows that, that yeah, that all those people who are worried about that, yeah, that does happen. That only happened for Jesus. But anyway, back to, the, back to the story here. So King Herod is, is terrified. And notice the scripture, what, what it's saying, it echoes very much what Peter says uh, when... Um, when uh, he's at Peter's confession there, when Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And Peter and, and some of the other apostles said, well, some say you're, you're Elijah or another prophet. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And that's when we have the great confession where Peter says, you are, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And to which Jesus responds and says, uh, yeah, blessed are Simon Peter and upon this rock. I will build my church. And of course, the, all of, of, of evangelical churches today go to that point, And we know that the rock that we were talking about there is the statement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. When, when, John is, when, when King Herod is saying, who is this? Listen to what verses 15 says. He is Elijah. And others say that he's a prophet. That's the, that's the first two things that, that, that Peter or that, that the apostles were telling them. This is who people say that I am. So J J uh, Jesus has this tremendous following, and Herod is terrified. But I want you to look today, this morning, why is Herod terrified? Why is Herod terrified? He is King Herod. Why would he be terrified? Ultimately, and this is where we have to be careful in our hearts this morning, Herod was convicted. Not like by a trial or anything like that, but he knew in his heart he was doing wrong. And that conviction is when someone says, you know you're doing wrong, you feel bad about it, and, 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 and good Christian uh, sanctification, that process of growing closer to God, that conviction should yield a change in behavior. If someone comes up to me and goes, Andrew, you're not handling this situation right. I need to be able to look at that situation. I need to be able to say, is, are, is, is there value to this comment? There is. I'm not handling this right. There should be sorrow. I should have to go and apologize. I should, I should just change everything. Should. There's a lot of shoulds in there, right? You want to know what I normally do? Someone comes up to me and says, Andrew, I don't think you're handling this right. And I go, well, I don't think you look good. Right? I don't think you know what you're talking about. Why well, don't you judge? Let's not you be judged, right? Let's just get all excited about the Bible and, 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 and get angry at the conviction. That is, that is a human nature. 
And when King Herod does it, because he's not just a human, but he has absolute power. So whenever he says, yeah, you shouldn't be marrying your brother's uh, wife, and I think everyone in the room would say, that seems like you shouldn't do. Um, and, and, and we would say, uh, yeah, you probably shouldn't have done that. But because Herod is Herod and he has all the power, he has all the control, he goes, I don't like what you have to say. I'm not going to call you names. I'm going to throw you in jail. I will silence you because I can. You see, it's funny how conviction, conviction in our heart can turn to anger, can turn to resentment, can turn to hostility. Now, it's real easy for us to stand around and say, man, Herod was in the wrong, and you can see that he was in the wrong, but we best be looking in our heart today and say, when has someone came to me and said, you're doing this wrong? Because what we're told in the Bible what the Bible tells us is that if, if, if we have this, this problem that we should go to a brother or sister in Christ and say, hey, I really think you need to improve in this area. I really, you, you have hurt me. And if they don't listen, we're supposed to take some others with us and go, hey, I really think you need to. There's this whole lineup. But I promise you today that if we go to somebody because of the culture that we have today, if I go to somebody and I say, hey, you're doing this wrong, what most likely will happen is I'll never see them in my church again. And honestly, I shouldn't have said it that way because it's not my church. This is our church. This is Oakland. This is, this is not mine. But we have a near 100% success rate at making people leave when they get mad. And that's not true of just Oakland. There's churches everywhere. You see, what we're told with, by, by the Apostle Paul is that God's word, it's written on nature, it's written on our hearts. And we know what's right and wrong. I think C.S. Lewis says it best, and, and he just an old, uh, actually not that old, but uh, uh, um, uh, writer, writer. Uh, one of the real real leaders, titans of the faith, but he has a book, Mere Christianity. And when he, he, he lines out Mere Christianity by saying that for all of history, it has been wrong. Every culture has a law against murder. Once you have a community, we decide it's not good to kill each other. Now, we can argue that outside of the community, and there's some other things, but, but every culture in all of human history has had a rule against murder. Every culture in all of human history has had a rule against stealing, has, has, had, has had a moral set of rules. This, is, this predates the Bible. This is, this is people who had no interaction with the Bible. You can go to some Aborigines tribe in the middle of the South Pacific, you know, uh, just a thousand years ago when they first met uh, European uh, 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 explorers, and they would have had this basic set of rules. God's law, his morality is written on nature. It's written on our hearts. We are predisposed to it. Now, through the scripture, and what I love about the Bible is that it just opens it all up, and I get to see the real understanding of it. But, what has happened, and, and I, I have coined this, I'm not uh, overly intelligent here, so don't beat me up too much on this. I have coined it the Pinocchio Syndrome. You guys know the story of Pinocchio, right? A little boy who was wood, and he became a boy, and, and the first thing that he had to get, if you remember, was what? What's boys? Do you guys know what, what he had to get? Yeah. You guys ever seen Pinocchio? I have failed as a parent. I have failed. This is terrible. He had to get a conscience, right? He had to get a conscience, right? And, and, and we love the Disney picture of the conscience, right? Right? Well, I'm going to tell you right and wrong, and, 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 and this is going to help you out. But here's the problem with human conscience. Human conscience is defined by our society. Human conscience starts to say, you know what? If it offends me, I don't like it. If it makes me feel bad, I don't like it. We take our human conscience, this, 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 this predisposed law on nature, law on our heart, and we don't marry it with the scripture, and we make bad decisions because they make us feel good. And we pursue that feeling. Just a couple of days ago, 
I saw a horrendous sight. And, and I don't, I, I'm going to speak very unintelligently again. You should be used to it by now. But it was a picture of the French, I assume it's parliament. I'm not sure what the French uh, governmental structure is called, but they look like kind of like a State of the Union kind of address, except it was French. And everybody's standing, cheering, clapping, celebrating. Because they wrote into whatever is equivalent to their constitution, the protection for women to have an abortion at any time. And we celebrated. They were celebrating. We have changed the discussion. We have changed the entire discussion. I, I saw a, a, a tweet by a, by a young lady who, who was a godly woman, and she said something to the effect of, we should celebrate women because God gave them the very unique ability to, to nurture life. Why would we not celebrate that womanhood and the person who responded? The snippet, the person who responded was someone who is uh, very much for the, uh, the, the pro-choice uh, uh, movement says, God gave me a brain so I could get a PhD so we could not degenerate our women to merely body parts. And I thought, my goodness. Now, I'm, I'm not here to, we're not going to get into a big discussion about any of that. The point of the matter is that when we let our culture define our conscience, we make tremendous separation from what the Bible says. And any time I talk about this, I have, I have to do this. I am compelled to do this. If anyone is sitting here and you, you've had an abortion, you've helped someone with an abortion or anything, do not, I am not, it's not my judgment. God's grace is sufficient, even for that. God's grace is so sufficient. And what Satan's going to want you to do is maybe, maybe you're sitting here and you're getting mad because I'm even talking about it. And you're sitting there saying, Andrew, you're not supposed to talk about politics from the pulpit. And I 100% agree with you. I will not stand from this pulpit where, 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 where we are to be studying the scripture. We're going to be studying from God's uh, word and tell you who to vote for, how to vote, or anything like that. What I will do is look at what the scripture says. And if the scripture calls something a sin, I'm going to have, by, by, by God's grace... I'm going to tell you the scripture calls us a sin. And we don't get to pick just because it's not convenient for us. And you know what else we don't get to do? We certainly don't get to judge. We certainly don't be the one who picks up the stones and starts chucking them. Someone comes into this assembly and we know their story, then we better say, man, that's between them and God. And we're going to show love and we're going to show compassion. We're going to love as much as we possibly can. You see, Herod was convicted, and that, convicted, that, uh, that conviction turns to anger, turns to resentment, and because he has absolute power, it ends with John the Baptist's head. I've read a story about a, a man named Henry Martin, who was a missionary uh, several decades ago, several, several decades ago, and his prayer was that he could burn for God, that he could set the world on fire for God. That was his prayer. As a missionary, he's going to travel the world and tell people about God. He wants to set the world on fire for God. When he was 31, he burned because of his conviction. He burned. His prayer was that he may burn for God. He got exactly what he prayed for. And I promise you, to him, it was his glory. Because he lived a life worthy of the punishment of death, of martyrdom. Guys, we are concerned all the time about who we're going to offend, who we're going to make mad, who we're going to make sad, who we're going to... Guys, can we go to the ends of the earth? Can we go... Before we get to the ends of the earth, can we go to the end of our street and tell people who Jesus is? Can we go to the end of our, when we, when we read this, where King Herod heard about it because he could see who Jesus was, or can we live a life that people can see us and they can go, man, I, I want what they have. I don't know what it is, but I want what they have. Are we, are, we, are we showing a life that people can see Christ in us? 
We live in a life that if someone really got convicted, that they would say, the only way to shut you up is to kill you. I don't know how far we are from that. Do I think it's going to happen in the U.S.? I don't know. Maybe. Is it going to happen tomorrow? No. Is it going to happen because you don't vote or do vote for somebody in our next election? Uh, sorry, it's not going to, it's not, it will not be that quick. But could it happen? Potentially. You're seeing it. You're seeing where people are losing their jobs. You're seeing where people are, are, are being convicted of hate crimes for staying on biblical principles. You do see that. So guys, let's stand on, let's stand on this. And if, 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 God, if God sees me worthy of dying for my faith, my prayer to you, my prayer to God, is that I take that openly and say, all right, God, thank you for counting me worthy. Thank you for, for this. But I promise you, my prayer will be very, very similar to what Jesus was saying in the, in the garden. He was saying, is there any other way? If I was ever lined up in front of a firing squad, this, is, this happened in the last 10 years. Missionaries lined up in front of a firing squad. I promise you, up until the very last second, my prayer is, let, please let the gun jam. Please let the people not shoot. Please, 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 please. But if God sees me worthy to end my life because of my commitment to him, well, first off, that's only a result of his grace because I'm pretty sure everybody around me would say that's not going to happen. But I want to live my life that God may see me worthy of that. That John the Baptist loses his head because of his conviction. And I want to make absolutely sure that in my heart that I'm not changing anything. That I want to respond to conviction with love. I want to respond to conviction with changing the way I act. Not with anger and resentment. Our closing song is number 300.